Um, for the next session, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Raj Punjabi to the Nash Forum. Uh, he's a CEO and co-founder of Last Mile Health, founded by the survivors of Liberia's civil war. Last Mile Health's mission is to save lives in the world's most remote communities, and there's surely a lot we would like to know about how Dr. Raj Punjabi paved his path as a change maker. To help us with that, we have Mr. Rohit Khanna, Executive Director at The Quint, handing it over to you, Rohit. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, Dr. Punjabi, we've never met, but uh, a quick hi. Uh, hi I'm particularly fascinated by the backstory, so I just want to quickly go over that. Uh, Dr. Punjabi's family, uh, out of choice and out of circumstances, has traveled all over the world. His family, due to the partition, they had to move from Sindh to, to Bombay uh, in 1947. Then, I think out of choice, the family chose to move to West Africa, uh, to the country of Liberia. Uh, then there was civil war there. And at the age of nine, Dr. Punjabi had to move to the U.S., to Carolina. And he uh, threw himself into medicine, became a fantastic doctor. And, and then uh, surprised everyone by coming right back to the place where he was born, to Liberia, um, and uh, set up at a very, very young age an organization called Last Mile Health. I think you were just 26 then, Dr. Punjabi? That's right, yes. Yeah, so yeah. that amazing, amazing amount of stuff that you've done at such a young age. Last Mile Health is about, is about something that is really absent from... Our, uh, a lot of what we think about health, that is the, literally the last mile health, the community health workers, people who work with people in the rural areas, in the hinterland, where health infrastructure does not reach. And Dr. Punjabi, I think in your childhood, in your, in, you know, that, that whole background helped you understand that. If you can, if you can give us a sense of what, what, what pushed you to create last mile health, what is it about your backstory and your, your experiences that, that created Last Mile Health? Why did you prioritize that over everything else in, in the field of medicine? Well, thank you, Rohit. And, 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 and this is such an important day for India. And um, I appreciate you sharing the story of my grandparents who fled Sindh and uh, lost their homeland. And, and yes, that is what sent my family to Liberia. So one was a personal connection to to West Africa. I mean, Liberia, after our civil war, had only 51 doctors left to serve a country of 4 million people. And this would be like, you know, Washington, D.C. or London having eight or 10 doctors to serve the entire city. So a huge shortage of doctors. So I was, I was partly moved by the problem. And having trained as a doctor, I wanted to have a chance to contribute to the country that had given me so much. But I have to say, part of it was inspired by India itself. I, on my way back to Liberia, I visited, visited my late nani in uh, Mumbai and my nana, and I had a chance to go to Eastern Maharashtra state where I met Dr. Abe and Rani Bang, uh, who are the founders of Search in Gadchiroli district. And they had done this powerful work uh, over many years, where they had managed to lower the death rate amongst our newborns in India in tribal areas by training and hiring the tribal women themselves to be health workers and be part of the healthcare team. And in fact, Abe and Rani's work inspired me so much, we named our firstborn child Abe after him. And a few months later, I went back to Liberia and I was moved by the power of that idea that if we look beyond our walls in healthcare, beyond our clinics, beyond our hospitals, and if we invest in the people closest to the pain, those that might be the neighbors of patients, uh, we could have not only uh, better, better access to healthcare, but we could do better in terms of the quality of healthcare and have greater justice in, in our healthcare system and make it more fair, I, I should say. So that, that's, Rohit, how, what, what really connected me. It was, it was both the combination of the outrage of seeing people die from conditions no one should die from in the 21st century, HIV, uh, complications of childbirth, but then also the power and the hope uh, and the potential to change that uh, based on examples like the one in Eastern Maharashtra State in Gajarola. So, uh, Raj, you, you would have been for, you would have obviously been following what's happening in West Africa, and, and I'm assuming also to a large extent how COVID has been 
uh, how COVID has been moving across India. Uh, yeah. uh, as, as someone who specializes in, in, in community health in the hinterland, and now we can see how in, in, in places, in the hinterland of Maharashtra, in, play, in states like Bihar, Bengal, and I think to some extent you would, it would be perhaps the same thing panning out in West Africa where testing is very low. Uh, what, are the, what, what, what is it that community health workers, what is it that can be done at the hinterland to, to get COVID under control in those areas? Because I think the, the cities have kind of, they've got the infrastructure. What about right. those outlying areas? Yeah. Well, I think it's such an important question, Brohit. You know, what, I, I've had the um, chance in my career as a doctor on the front lines, as well as leading Last Mile Health, to respond to epidemics like HIV, Ebola in West Africa, which killed so many of our people, uh, and now COVID uh, here in Boston, and also uh, supporting the training of health workers in, in Africa. Uh, and you know what we've learned, if there's one thing I've learned throughout all of this, it's a simple point, is that outbreaks start and stop in communities. We need hospitals. We need clinics. Those, as you mentioned, exist in cities. In rural areas, they're sparse. And we just can't stop COVID uh, uh, or any epidemic unless we extend the reach of healthcare into communities themselves. And so one of the best ways to do that is actually to hire and train and equip people from the community, even those without a high school degree. In fact, most community health workers lack a, even a high school qualification to join the healthcare team. And so in Africa, what they're doing and we're working in Liberia, also in support of Ethiopia and Malawi uh, as well. We're, we're training thousands of those community and frontline health workers, the nurses who supervise them, to go door to door to screen patients for COVID symptoms. Do you have a fever? Do you have shortness of breath? Do you have a cough? Do you, uh, do you have a sore throat? And make sure that those patients get tested quickly and make sure that those who are test positive get into care quickly if they need to be isolated at home, that they get support, but also if they get sick, that they come into the hospital more quickly. And the last thing, of course, is to make sure that tracing happens. You know, they're making sure that the people exposed to that patient uh, are supported, followed, and monitored for symptoms. So, so that's a critical aspect. But, you know, one other thing we know, Rohit, uh, from COVID and other epidemics is that these epidemics don't just devastate our immune systems. They devastate our health systems. So millions more children will die from malaria during this time across the poorest countries on Earth, including India. Uh, uh, because they ha their health workers have been infected by COVID or the health system has been overwhelmed by COVID. So one of the critical things community health workers are doing is in fact finding a community-based way door to door to keep malaria testing and treatment going. So for example, in Liberia, uh, they are, the community health workers are testing and treating one out of two rural children in the country for malaria and saving lives because of that. So they've been able to keep that going uh, because now they're putting on the masks and the gowns and the gloves and getting the support. And I should also mention that across India, Last Mile Health has been involved with our colleagues at Harvard University and a number of partners through an in initiative called the Community Health Academy, where we've been training leaders of community health programs in India. And uh, thousands have enrolled in our online courses covering COVID and community health. Uh, and, you know, we have content available there in Hindi, and we're finding that, in fact, some of the same dynamic exists in India. And, and I think you know the story, and we could get into it, of the fact that of India's million women on the front lines, these ASHA workers oh, sure. uh, and, 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 and other community-based providers, they are on the front lines doing the same kind of work as Liberia. But the challenge here, Rohit, is that our governments, our leaders, our health systems, have to better support these workers. I think many of them in India just in the last week have gone on strike for two days because they don't have the protest protective equipment on the front lines and they're not getting the living fair wage that they deserve. So uh, I was going to actually talk a, a bit about it, but you already brought it up. Uh, uh, Raj, what is your strategy when you deal with, with the government, with the, with the state government, with the district magistrate, with the police officials? How much patience do you show? What is your strategy? How do you get these guys to buy into what you are doing? And, and because there's so much classism, casteism here, the Asha worker is, is not treated, uh, you know, with the, with the dignity that she should get. 
how do you deal with that right right i mean i you know there i was uh, i was speaking about the dignity right uh, there's a there's a woman named uh, badwan devi she's a community health worker in india who's knocking on doors to find patients with COVID. And she was quoted in an, uh, an, an interview I did with PBS NewsHour a few weeks ago. She said, I don't have the salary. I can buy gloves or pay the rent or feed myself. What do I do? So what is this? This is a story of an individual in our country in India who is struggling to both care for her community and be cared for by the society and the government that she's in. So I think one key thing that we do is to humanize women and like Badwan. Uh, but the other thing we have to do is to make sure we remember that power is not given. It must be demanded. So we have to stand with them to demand equal pay for equal work. So this is one of the critical things. You know, when you look around the world, one trillion dollars of women's contribution to healthcare globally, one trillion, goes unpaid. That's, that's larger than the economies of 150 countries, one trillion dollars. So this is because, because so many of them are, as you said, uh, under-recognized. So this is a second area, is to really push the governments that are resistant. Now, other governments, and I think India is one of them, actually is interested. They have this cadre, the, the one million or so community health workers across India. But now the issue is to say, look, you're spending a very little amount on your public health system. And this is a problem in so many countries, including here in the United States, where COVID is running wild. I mean, the two countries, uh, the few countries in the world that have crossed two million coronavirus cases are United States, India is amongst them. So we, don't, we need the public health workforce at the community level. So there what we're trying to argue is to say, look, we all agree it's the right thing to do to pay these women, to pay community health workers, to invest in these health workers, to protect them with the equipment. But it turns out it's also the smart thing to do economically. So that's the third thing is to really sit with them, to analyze what is the return on investment here? And you'll be surprised. For every dollar we invest in paying a community health worker and supporting her, society gets $10 in return from not only outbreaks prevented. Imagine how many trillions of dollars have been lost from COVID. How much better we could have had a response if we maybe would have stopped the spread so widely. Uh, uh, that alone is a clear argument. Uh, for one way this, the, the, these workers return to the economy. The other one, of course, is that they save lives, they extend life years, like the, the children in Gacharoli. But the third one, Rohit, and it's one that finance ministers and uh, heads of state uh, and prime ministers ought to be thinking about right now. If you, COVID, by, we have had to slow our economies. When we slow our economies to stop COVID, we also lose jobs. So right now, every country has to recover their economy. Why not give jobs, well-paying jobs, to women like those Ashas who can both save lives and be a venue for you to create millions of jobs? I, this is the third argument, is that they create jobs. So that's, those are the three things, the moral, the pressure when governments are refusing to pay attention, and when they pay attention to help them see that there's an economic argument for this as well, not just a moral one. Uh. Raj, I think we've zipped through the little bit of time that we had, but you've said a lot in very little time, and I'm I, and it has been exercising us because we are in a newsroom at the Quint, and we are wrestling all day with what is it that we can do. Uh, we're so we're so metrocentric. Uh, we our stories keep swinging around Delhi and Mumbai. Uh, we almost never get to Gachiroli. Uh, you've been there. I hate to admit I've not been there, but mm. and one has heard about uh, Doctor uh, both the couple, Doctor Bam and his wife. Uh, but our attention doesn't go there often enough. Our attention doesn't go. The 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 Asha workers are protesting at Jantar Mantar, but we don't see the cameras land up there and you know uh, you know, give them a voice. Uh, I, I hope that changes this idea that you've had that it's. These Asha workers could be economic engines, you know, give them jobs, make them, they, they, they even become consumers, you know, so that, that, that could all happen. Uh, thanks for saying all of this. It, it's really close to our heart. Thank you so much for giving us your time. 
and uh, lovely to have met you uh, and, and spoken to you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Rohit. And let me just say, you know, because this is such an important day for India and this is such a painful moment for everyone. We're all feeling this pain from COVID in one form or another from this pandemic. So I'll just share something my father shared in closing. It's just that, you know, in West Africa, we have a saying, no condition is permanent. No condition is permanent. And, and I think when I think about the hard times in this, in, this, in this pandemic, I really turn back to that lesson from my father. Um, you know, we're not defined by the conditions we face. We're defined by how we respond. And so this, let this be a chance for us to, to extend equity and healthcare to all of India's people uh, by investing in the people themselves. So thank you so much, Rohit. I, I appreciate your time and I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that also. Thank you, thank you so much. Take care. Thanks a lot, Dr. Raj Punjabi, and thanks, Rohit, for facilitating such a beautiful session. Uh, one thing that really stood out to me um, in the session is, um, first thing is, I think, uh, no condition is permanent. Uh, that's the first takeaway for me. And the second is, uh, power is not given, it is demanded. Uh, so I think that really struck with me. Um, and thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Raj Punjabi, for all the work that you're doing uh, with the ASHA workers, the community workers, and all the best for your journey going forward. Thank you.